All right, good to see you all here bright and early. Um, our session this morning um, is fisheries conservation man management and monitoring. And we have talks ranging from habitats here in Florida, Maryland, and all the way out to Morro Bay. Our first speaker this morning is Megan Schrant. She works for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for the Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. She is their estuarine monitoring program lead, um, and she's gonna be talking about sport fish abundance and changing estuaries. Thanks, Carrie. Good morning, everybody. Um, today, I am just going to kind of give you the whirlwind introduction um, to some preliminary analyses, trying to relate um, fish abundance patterns and potentially um, a link to um, how they respond to disturbances. So Florida is touted the fishing capital of the world, usually for about three main reasons, um, natural resources or the fisheries themselves, the infrastructure or the access that we have to those fisheries, and also um, the management of those fisheries to keep them sustainable into the future, which is really important since we not only have a very high fishing pressure, but also because as we have seen um, all day yesterday, Florida is no stranger to disturbances. A lot of times we think about things like hurricanes here on the southwest coast of Florida. Uh, like we discussed yesterday, we've also got a range of harmful algal blooms. And in this area in particular, red tide is one of um, the ones that we tend to focus on. But we also have other events like these prolonged cold weather events that can affect our subtropical and tropical fish species. Um, and then another thing to note is that our fishermen and our stakeholders are very active in their fisheries. So the picture on the right here shows um, some fishermen sort of responding to that cold weather event, and they're actually helping remove dead fish from the waters. Um, and these were common snook in that scenario. Um, so since our stakeholders are really interested and very active, they have a role in fisheries management, but the managers also look to science um, to help monitor those populations. And one of those pieces of the scientific data are um, fisheries independent monitoring data, which we're lucky enough in the state of Florida to have long-term monitoring data for a variety of fish species and size classes from multiple estuaries throughout the state. Um, the map here just depicts the main estuaries that uh, we sample, but we are in other estuaries as well. And this allows us to track sport fish populations over time. Uh-oh, I lost clicker control. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ooh, back one. Okay, um, so going back to that cold weather event, um, this, uh, these are data, abundance data for common snook in the you know, legal size population. And um, over time, so there's the blue arrow at the top, which denotes that 2010 cold event, and you'll see this drop in the population size, followed by subsequent recovery, but that recovery can change depending on which estuary you are in um, and the degree of that recovery. Um, so that each panel is just a different uh, system here in Florida. So we're, we know that common snook and other sport fish species are definitely responding differently to different events um, within their different systems. So that kind of leads us to ask the question of, you know, what allows for this resilience or recovery over time, but also the differential recovery among systems. And one topic that I just want to kind of throw out there is the idea of this um, ecological refuge. A lot of times we think of refugia, um, which is the evolutionary time scale, and a lot of times with refuges and refugia, we also think of a very physical geographic location or a specific habitat. But today I want to challenge you to also think about the other aspect of refugia or refuges on the ecological time scale um, that deals with the organism itself. So these are things like morphological characteristics, like history, um, behavior, and just kind of any traits that these animals have to help them respond to disturbances and persist over time. So today for the ecological time scale, um, obviously habitat is very important, especially if we're talking about disturbances. If you don't have habitat available, it's going to be really hard to recover. Um, but today I really want to focus on the idea of um, size classes as well. And I like to think of this as sort of a biological buffer to help populations recover after those disturbances. So having Kind of a buffer of earlier size classes or age classes if you want to think of them that way might help you or help a population recover um, quicker or um, in different systems 
So today we'll really briefly look at two sport fish species in southwest Florida. We've got red drum and common snook, um, just as our example species. So these are fisheries that both have that long-term monitoring data along the southwest Florida coast. And you know they've been subjected to multiple disturbances over time. Uh, so we can kind of track their abundances over time. And remember that population response to any sort of disturbance um, is a combination of habitat and life history and other characteristics. So the, both of these species have some things in common. They're both estuarine and inshore fishery species. And um, their early life stage is dependent on low saline waters. And then they transition to more saline areas as they grow and age. They can both be habitat generalists. Um, and in terms of management, they're both managed with bag and size limits and as slot fisheries. Currently, they are both catch and release in some areas of southwest Florida as a direct result of the prolonged 2018 red tide event. Now, since they are slot fisheries, this means that these fish are both entering and exiting the fishery, but they're doing so at different size classes, and their fisheries are definitely a little bit different. So red drum, the recreational fishery, is a pretty young fishery. We're usually actually fishing the juveniles of this fishery. So they enter around age one or two. The vast majority of the fishery is actually ages two and three. Um, common snook, on the other hand, they don't enter the fishery until they're roughly five years old. Um, most of the fishery is comprised of five, six, and seven-year-olds. Um, but we have seen fish within the fishery size limit that are age 12. Um, so you could have anywhere from like three to six or seven age classes in the fishery at any given time. All right, so um, the fishery is usually what you know the fishermen are seeing and what we're really acting on management-wise directly. Um, so we know that we've got trends um, in legal size populations that can differ among estuaries. Um, and so here we've got red drum abundance over time on the left, common snook abundance on the right. The panels are Tampa Bay at the top, Sarasota Bay in the middle, and Charlotte Harbor at the bottom. And you'll see our differences in the time scale or the time series, depending on which estuary you're in. And you'll just note that you know there are differences among estuaries in terms of their abundances, but there are also some similarities. So if you focus on Red Drum, that left panel, um, and then Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor, so the top and the bottom panels, you'll notice that their trends over time are actually pretty similar. Um, but when we're thinking about management and you know how we can potentially help inform management in terms of responding to disturbances, it'd be great if we could actually kind of predict what's going to happen in that adult fishery. Um, so we want to ask the question of whether early life history or early life abundances can be a predictor for the fishery size classes. Um, so now our panel graphic here is actually still abundance over time, but in this case, it's actually each panel is a size class. So we've got early young of the years at the top, going all the way down or growing into the legal and the post-legal size fish for red drum. And we want to know if we can kind of track these abundances, you know, through their size classes. So the question is really, do any of these top graphics mimic the one for the legal size, which is the one from the second, second one from the bottom? So one way that we can look at this is through lag regressions. Um, now, we have to use lag regressions because we need to match up the abundance of the adult with you know, the young of the year class that actually makes up that adult fishery. Um, so just a reminder here, red drum, young of the year to legal size, they, they grow to legal size within about a year. So it's this young fishery idea. Um, and there's about three year classes in the fishery at any given time. So when we're running a lag regression between young of the year and legal sized fishes, there's gonna be a one year lag um, between those abundances that we're comparing, but the young of the year abundance is actually going to be a rolling average of the three years that make up that fishery um, class at any given time. So what this really looks like, um, here we've got uh, legal size abundance on the y-axis and late young of the year abundance on the x-axis for red drum. This is Tampa Bay. Um, the um, Points are actually labeled as years in this case, and that year corresponds to the year class of the legal size um, portion of that fishery. So the abundance for the young of the years is, you know, the rolling average of three years prior to that one year that you see on the graph. And what we see is that we've got this positive relationship, and it is significant. So we do have a pretty good predictor of legal size abundance by looking at the abundance of those late young of the year individuals. And this relationship holds for both Sarasota Bay here in the middle and Charlotte Harbor on the right. So 
Um, young of the year, late young of the year abundance is probably our best predictor of legal size abundance for Southwest Florida red drum. Um, and this is kind of to be expected because you know we can they grow quickly into the fishery and they have a, sm a small range of age classes or size classes within the fishery. So we would expect a pretty pretty good relationship between these two. Now, if you remember, common snook, their fishery is a little bit different. Um, so, spoiler alert, it's not quite as clean as red drum when we do this. Um, so here we've got examples of young of the year through legal size snook on the, um, in the panel graphic, and it's just for Tampa Bay. But to remind you and give you some examples of, you know, the relationships between our size classes here, young of the year to age two is about two years. Um, young of the year to legal size takes about three years to get there, or sublegal size, sorry, is three years. And then young of the year to legal size takes about five years. So they're entering the fishery at five years old. We have about three year classes in the fishery at any given time. And if we were to look at just the sublegal portion, we've got about two year classes. All right. So giving you a little spoiler into what the regressions are going to look like on the next slide. Um, we can do lag regressions for sublegal size individuals and young of the years, which in this case is going to be a three year lag because it takes three years to grow to that sublegal size. And our rolling average for young of the years is now over two years to match with that two year classes in the sublegal population. Um, like I said, they're not quite as clean as red drums, so now their predictive ability actually differs among both life stages and estuaries. So here we're looking at Tampa Bay, we've got sublegal abundance on the Y axis. On the X axis, we've got young of the year abundance for bay habitats on the left, river habitats in the middle, and age two on the right. All of them have significant positive relationships, but our best relationship is actually the young of the year in the riverine habitats. Um, it's our strongest predictor. And this reinforces that idea that they need those low saline habitats um, in those early life stages. Now, like I said before, this, you know, this fishery has got a few more size classes in it, a few more ages in it. So when we actually try to do our regressions on the legal size portion of the population, they tend to fall apart. Um, um, so it's probably, in this case, a direct result of the fact that you know fish growth is not linear over time. So maybe if we did this with ages instead of just strict age size classes, it could clean up a little bit. So that would be our next step in this case. So for Tampa Bay, young of the year and age two are our best predictors of the sublegal or that pre-fishery population. And this relationship holds or is pretty similar for Sarasota Bay and Charlotte Harbor as well. But in these cases, age one and then age two in Charlotte Harbor are actually our best predictors of that sublegal portion of the snook population. So if we bring this back to the idea of refuges and you know responding to disturbances, remember we have both these habitat and life history components. So we know that low salinity habitats are critical for early life stages of these fisheries, and I definitely pointed it out for common snook here. Um, and now that we see that there's this relationship between early life abundances and fishery or you know pre-fishery sizes, that can help us aid um, management or inform management and kind of help predict you know how things are going to respond to disturbances. So having something like an unimpact source of young fish might help um, the population recover a little bit quicker, potentially within a generation, and that generation being the time that it takes to reach legal size. So monitoring these pre-fishery sizes can help us predict abundance in the fishery going into future years, but it can also help inform management in terms of potentially, you know, the duration of time that it could take for that fish stock to recover. Um, so they have an idea of how long to um, keep management, emergency management decisions in place. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, our funding sources and FWRI Fisheries Independent Monitoring staff for diligently sampling over 20 plus years in multiple asteroids in the state of Florida. Um, and if I have time, I will take any questions. We have time for questions. Uh, so my question was just in terms of how, I guess, the trials and tribulations you would have with determining how snook and especially in the freshwater riverine systems are utilizing uh, refuges and how what kind of challenges you are presented in 
looking at their usage. Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat this one? <laughs> so in the graph you identified sort of common snook that the the river riverine systems were ideal for for, uh, for their populations. And so how would you I guess in terms of how is FWC or how going forward would you try to identify how refuge are used by the snook in that instance? Um, yes. Okay. So um, I just want to let you know that it took us a while to figure out that um, those juvenile snook are in those river habitats. Um, also, a river habitat in one system doesn't equal a river habitat in another system. <laughs> um, so we're quickly finding out, for example, common snook, um, you know, they're using our major rivers in Tampa Bay um, as their primary habitat, but in areas like Charlotte Harbor, it's more tidal tributaries or ephemerally connected ponds. Um, so as we are managing and like looking or monitoring, and then we're also kind of expanding into other areas, we are, you know, slowly beginning to piece together these different, um, habitats that they're using. Um, so it's kind of a combination of, we need, you know, the original monitoring data that we have, and then also looking at these special projects and trying to, you know, get into other areas and see which habitats they're really using. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Our next speaker is Kara Radabell. She's also from the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission with our Coastal Wetlands Research Group. And she'll be talking about habitat preference for common snook and red drum. So that question is actually a great transition into this talk. <laughs> So I'll be presenting this on behalf of Scott Adams, so I'd like to recognize him as well as my other co-authors. Um, this project was conducted within the Habitat Research Group. We work in coastal wetlands research at FWC, and this is in collaboration with fisheries research at FWC. So I'm also going to be talking about common snook and red drum, but from a slightly different perspective. So both of these fish, as you've heard, they are popular sport fish uh, within the Tampa Bay area. And they are also supplemented by juvenile releases from aquaculture programs as part of FWC's stock enhancement program. So they release these very small fish out into the estuaries to help supplement the fisheries and the population. And so understanding the natural habitat selection of these very small fish can help to identify the best locations to release these stock in order to maximize their chance of survival once they are released. So our study area for this included the four major rivers in Tampa Bay, the Hillsborough, Alafaya, Little Manatee, and Manatee Rivers. And our study questions were, what are the habitat characteristics of juvenile snook and red drum hotspots in Tampa Bay rivers? And also, why do some mangrove shorelines host high populations of juvenile snook and red drum while others do not? I might be frozen here. Be prepared for it to jump four slides. <laughs> uh, refresh it, Gary. There we go. Thank you. So we identified our sites um, by using the catch per unit effort data from the FWC Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. So they've been conducting randomized monitoring across Tampa Bay for many, many years. And been using say nets to collect these fish and identify and uh, the fish and uh, measure their lengths. So we are compiling data from 1996 to 2017. And then we narrowed it down to snook that are under 12 centimeters in length and red drum that were under 18 centimeters in standard length. And in this map here, it's showing the catch per unit effort for snook in the Alafai River. And the size of the orange circles is showing that at CPUE, so larger circles are more snook. And from this data set, we're identifying 10 hot spots and 10 cold spots in rivers across Tampa Bay. 
So the hotspots were identified as locations that um, contain CPUE within the 95th percentile, and the cold spots had no snook at all. So in the map, the red triangles are the hot spots, blue triangles are the cold spots, and then there's also a, a buffer zone between them, so we didn't have sites right on top of each other. Now, the study also looked at red drum, but in the interest of being efficient, we used the same sites for the red drum study as well. So with those same locations, we just reclassified them as being red drum hot spots or cold spots using the red drum CPUE data. Oh, thank you. So our field methods, we visited our sites, which were 10 meter segments of shoreline. We visited them between June and September of 2019 for shoreline characterization. And this included uh, taking measurements of water quality, water depth, noting the riverbank type, was it riprap or seawall or a natural shoreline. We took measurements of canopy density to look at the amount of shading in the water. We documented the vegetation heights and species of vegetation along the bank, documented percent cover within a one by one meter quadrat shown here um, that we would lay down on the ground. Oh, let's go back to the slide still. <laughs> Can you go back, please? I, I could just ask you to advance it. Maybe that would be easier. <clears throat> And so we documented percent cover by leafy debris, woody debris, uh, and vegetation. We also documented the presence of oyster reefs and used an RTK GPS to record shoreline elevation and then later calculate slope. And we also collected sediment samples from the middle of the channel and along the shoreline. Next slide, please. So we brought the sediment back to the lab and we analyzed it for organic matter contents by using a loss on ignition methodology where we take the sediment and we burn off the organic matter. The amount of weight lost is, uh, we can calculate percent organic matter from that weight. And we also uh, analyzed grain size using sieves and using Google Earth. We measured the width of the water body at all of these shorelines that we uh, were sampling. And then we also, because some of these areas were back in bayous or tributaries, we also measured the width of what is the narrowest access point to these locations in the backwaters. Next slide, please. So here's our results for the snook. In these graphs, uh, the graph on the left is showing the frequency of riverbank type for the hot spots and cold spots for the snook. And it's showing uh, the riprap, seawall, and sediments. And although more snook hotspots were found on natural shorelines with sediment, it actually was not a statistically significant difference between the hotspots and cold spots. And with the frequency of vegetation type, if we break it down by mangrove, salt marsh, freshwater marsh, upland vegetation, and no vegetation, there also was not a significant difference. So these snook hotspots, <clears throat> however, they were more frequently found in bayous and tributaries rather than on the main stem of the river. And these snook hotspots, they had significantly narrower water widths and water access widths. They had shallower water and also higher sediment percent organic matter, which is an indicator of low flow conditions. So we then took the vegetation data and using the most common species, created a, a PCA, a principal component analysis. So in this analysis on the graph on the left is just showing the plant species. The graph on the right is are all of the sites, but uh, following the same pattern. And it kind of broke down into four main groups where we had, I don't know if my pointer will work. Well, we had red mangrove on the upper left, uh, sites dominated by red mangroves. In the center, sites dominated by upland vegetation and freshwater vegetation. In the lower left, that's the salt marsh sites. There's also a lot of white mangrove there. And on the far right, these are sites with no vegetation at all. 
And really the thing to see here, the red icons, you don't need to read the letters, but just know the red means the hot spots and the black means the cold spots, is that there were hot spots found at all different types of vegetation. There wasn't a specific um, species of vegetation that these snook were gravitating towards, but they, they were found at a wide variety. And even in a couple of the sites with no vegetation, but hot spots were much less common if there was no vegetation. So if we looked just at the mangroves, trying to figure out why are some mangroves better than others, the mangrove only snook hot spots were on natural shorelines. So they preferred those over the sites that had riprap or seawall behind the mangroves. They, again, they're much more common in the bayous and tributaries and not on the river main stem. And again, these mangrove sites had higher percent organic matter, which is an indicator of low water flow. Next, please. Thanks. So what do they want? These bayous and tributaries, uh, they're offering protection from the predators, not only through physical distance from the estuary, but also the shallow water depths and these narrow uh, connection points to these bayous. They limit the size of the fish that can get into these backwater areas. And also a lot of studies find that the lower salinity excludes marine predators because they can't survive in such low salinity. We did not find a difference in salinity between the hot spot and cold spots in this study, but also remember we're already back in the rivers. So almost all of these sites, so they're gonna have a lower salinity than what you find out in the bay. And so this vegetation, it provides a structure to hide. So if we were to oversimplify the results from our study, we would say that snip don't always prefer mangroves, but when they do, it's on a natural shoreline, among other things. So with the red drum, our results are slightly different for what habitat the red drum are preferring. So again, there is no affiliation with riverbank type, uh, be it riprap, seawall, or sediments, but they were more frequently adjacent to mangroves. That was the most common habitat that we found them used to. And these red drum hotspots, they were not affiliated with the bayous and tributaries. And these red drum hotspots, they were located at wider select sections of the rivers, and they had higher dissolved oxygen, larger grain sizes, and lower sediment organic matter. And all of these are indicators of locations that have high flow conditions. <clears throat> so if we apply the, the same PCA, because remember we're visiting the same sites, but now just looking at red drum, so the breakdown of the vegetation is the same here, but now the colors are showing in red what are the red drum hotspots. We notice that they tend to have hotspots on locations that have red mangrove or the salt marsh and the white mangrove. There's a lot more red in those regions of the PCA. And again, there's not as many hotspots and locations with no vegetation or upland vegetation or fresh water. So the red drum, they prefer different mangroves. So the red drum mangrove hotspots, um, they did include some locations with seawall and riprap as long as there were mangroves in front of them. They were much more common on the river main stem uh, than in the bayous and tributaries. And uh, these mangrove hotspots, they also had lower organic matter in the sediments in these high flow regions. <clears throat> so what does a red drum want? Uh, again, they're looking to find food and not be eaten, much like the snook. So they're trying to find structure to uh, hide from predators, but they are preferring these high flow habitats on the main stem of the river. And again, we didn't find a salinity difference between the hot spots and cold spots, but again, we're back in the rivers. And so it's gonna be a lower salinity there in general. So if we wanna drastically oversimplify what a red drum wants, then we can say red drum often prefer mangroves, but they're less picky than the snook. Well, the next slide is actually my acknowledgements. So I'd like to acknowledge my funding uh, or our funding for this project and also collaboration with the, the FWC uh, FIM group. We use their massive database of fisheries data, which was uh, critical for creating the study and identifying what are the, the hotspots and cold spots of uh, fish across Tampa Bay and also acknowledge um, the sport fish restoration funding that helped to support this. And I can take any questions while we're trying to transition. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Kara. We do have time for questions. Oh, wait for Joe, please. And that, that's really, that was a great presentation. I, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was the um, your finding about the differences between mangrove fringe that has a hardened shoreline behind it and those that are natural for snook. Um, because, you know, I wonder if that has implications for living shoreline projects. And, you know, there's a lot of interest in building, you know, natural uh, you know, natural shorelines, but leaving like a hardened shoreline in place. So it sounds like for um, for the red drum, it didn't seem to matter, but perhaps for snook, it does. So my question is, um, what would you recommend for further like research into that? Like, could it be that there's a, an effective distance from the shoreline? So if you were to build out from a, a hardened seawall, for example, you know, perhaps there's a, a minimum distance that you want to to look at i don't know i'm just thinking out loud but i just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that because I, I think that kind of work has some real implications in how we go about perhaps designing some of these living shoreline projects thanks yeah that, that, that's a great point and i'm i'm also just thinking out loud and thinking it's it's not a, it's in addition to how do you construct the shoreline and how far away from the shoreline do you place it but it's also the location so you could make a similarly designed shoreline in a, in a bayou or a tributary versus a shoreline in the main stem of the river or even out in the bay. You would probably get entirely different fish using that as habitat, just depending on if they want the backwaters or if they want the bay or if they want the main stem of the river. So with this study here, it's showing that, you know, if you constructed one on the main stem versus in the bayou, you might just have different fish, but some fish are going to use it, just different species. Um, but it would be interesting to then expand it to even more species of fish to show, you know, what do the other species select for for these habitats? Because with a given design of the living shoreline, there might be different species that target it beyond these two. So we have a question from Will Van Gulder. He said, does FWC actively look to participate in coastal restoration to add features that support juvenile species? This would include funding for specific, for species specific features. So FWC does participate in uh, marine and estuarine restoration, yes. And as one of the, the primary motivators for this restoration is restoring uh, habitats. And often when we're applying for funding, that's one of the justifications is that we're trying to restore habitat for these uh, critical species. And also monitoring of the species after the installation of the habitat is very common to verify that, you know, the, the fish or birds or whatever species of interest are starting to use the habitat after it's been restored. Great, thank you. having some technical difficulties if you haven't seen them already. <laughs> Please bear with us. Hey, um, hey Kara, just one quick question. Um, you mentioned that there was a 10 meter shoreline length. It, what's the reason why you chose 10 meters for, for that length? Honestly, it was just part of our habitat design in order to have something um, small enough in and honestly, we could have done a larger shoreline, but it also has to do with the fact that uh, the low, we wanted to incorporate a small degree of variability, but not enough variability that we're looking at, you know, five times that would incorporate a large variety of different shoreline types, because a lot of these areas, you'll transition from a neighborhood to right next door to a natural area and a lot next door to another neighborhood. So we really wanted to narrow it down to some of these hot spots are very small. So if it was just an empty lot that has a lot of vegetation on it, if that's the hot spot, we want to characterize that area and not necessarily the larger stretch of river, because some of these hot spots are highly localized and the sea walls are highly localized. So it's just because they were smaller hotspots in some of these regions. <laughs> Sorry, I have another question. 
Um, was the what was there any SAV presence like seagrass or any submerged aquatic vegetation present? Do you think that makes a difference? So and that's you know, it. I promise that's my last. <laughs> you know, we did not include that in this part of the study. I haven't even mentioned we also did this study up in Apalachicola Bay. Um, following the exact same methods. We were looking at red from only up in Apalachicola Bay, and we were looking at um, seagrass and things like oyster reefs, and we were finding that, yes, there was some association with seagrass and oyster reefs, um, but we did not do that in this, just because um, in some of these locations, it's really, they're in the rivers. There's not a lot of seagrass in general. Um, if we had done the study further out in the bay, um, where there are a lot of redfish, it, it would have made a lot of sense to look at seagrass associations because the red rum do really like the seagrass there as well um, but just being back in the rivers there, there wasn't a lot of seagrass back there to begin with I have a quick question on well a couple on what he mentioned about the site selection I know FIM uses stratified random so a lot of times you you have to have a vegetative shoreline and in that micrograde you've got one spot so it gets revisited but did you have any trouble going across years finding like how did you normalize your sites to to narrow down that 10 meter across years when it was should have been somewhat random on the site selection I'm going to try to have to answer on behalf of Scott who did that site selection so he he was pooling data across all of the years and then I, I believe it was a matter of finding that the average CPUE and then finding the highest in, in the 95th percentile across all, the, all of those years, I, I believe is what um, he did to identify those hotspots. Okay, uh, and then on the species specific habitat, I love this idea. It's something I've been thinking about for a little while now. Have you had any interaction with, um, agencies or discussions on the value of rather than just general quote unquote habitat restoration with a species have you guys engaged in any of that with regulatory agencies all right thank you everybody for your patience um our next speaker is carrie flaherty walia she is also with fwri and today she's going to be talking about fish communities on hard bottom habitats in tampa bay Okay, so since my time is up, you guys have seen the title slide. So if you have any questions, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so um, I'm gonna be talking about um, a habitat within Tampa Bay that's been relatively understudied uh, over the years, unlike some of the other habitats that um, Megan and Kara have talked about. Um, and it's uh, hard bottom habitats within the Tampa Bay system. Next. So when you think about hard bottom habitats within Florida, usually you think of Florida Keys and the barrier reef that's located along the Keys system, uh, but there's also some discontinuous reefs um, throughout the West Florida shelf, um, which you can see kind of, you know, dots of that in this uh, map here. And they're known as biodiversity hotspots for several animals. Um, and in addition to these natural hard bottom habitats, there's also been thousands of artificial reefs that have been deployed over the years. And these habitats are highly targeted by uh, recreational and commercial fishermen for tasty species like snapper and grouper. Um, so um, they're, they're a habitat that we want to know more about. Next. So for most reef fishes, including snappers and groupers, they have complex life histories. So when they're juveniles, they usually recruit into the estuaries along mangrove shorelines and seagrasses. And then when they grow into subadults and adults, they move into deeper areas. And then as adults, they move offshore into offshore reefs. Now, the juvenile life stage, we have a pretty good handle on. Um, since 1989, there's been sampling going on within the estuary over seagrass beds. And more recently, there's been monitoring that's been happening on the West Florida shelf on offshore reefs using, using different gear types. But there's this in-between um, uh, life stage, next. Um, and there's estuarine hard bottom that's located in Tampa Bay, and um, there's not a lot known about it. So what we do know about it is that it's easily accessible to anglers. So instead of going, you know, 20 miles offshore to target some of these reef species, some legally sized fish can be found within the bay. And the other thing we know about it is that um, we can't use seines and trawls to sample it. So it's either going to damage the gear or it's um, going to damage the habitat. 
next and next. So what we really wanted to know is, is this in-between habitat, is this estuarine hard bo bottom functioning as a connection between these reefs? And if so, what fish assemblages live there? Next. And the objectives of this study um, were to look at um, fish assemblages over space and time um, on these habitats, and then look at fisheries connectivity between these habitats from inshore to offshore. Next. So, um, this project came along at a good time because there was some new information available and also some affordable technology. So the map here is showing some mapped hard bottom that the Water Management District contracted out. Um, and that study was completed in 2017. And since then, they've mapped even more hard bottom habitat in, um, in the Bay. So um, we knew where to find these habitats and then we just had to figure out how to sample them so offshore um, they use camera systems um, which you see the the smaller picture there it's got an aluminum frame and it's it's really kind of high-tech and complex expensive cameras it's heavy um, and that was overkill for what we were going to be needing to do in the estuary so we um, took that design and basically made a, a pared down version of that using PVC um, and we put two GoPros on it. So, you know, those are obviously easily accessible and portable. Um, we put two of them on the unit at the same angle and distance that the offshore sampling has been doing, so it could potentially be comparable. Um, and we put a bait arm in the front because within the estuary, obviously, you know that turbidity may be an issue, so we weren't sure if this video technology was gonna work. Um, so, next. Next. It's a cool gear type, right? So what's on the next slide is actually a map of the sampling sites. And um, we did a pre pretty good, um, we had pretty good coverage of the areas of hard bottom that were mapped. And we looked at three different habitat types during this study. We looked at artificial hard bottom, um, natural hard bottom, and then we also actually deployed these units along the Skyway Bridge. And you know, if you're not from here, it's the giant bridge that goes between St. Pete and, ah, oh, here we go. Um, so all these squares are, um, the uh, sampling universe that we used to select our site. So we deployed that um, BRUV unit or the baited remote underwater video system and we also did some hook and line as well. Um, and then next has some examples of what these habitats look like in the bay. This is a three year study. Next. Um, so let's take a look at some of the fish that we saw on these habitats. Next. So, um, when we looked at um, species diversity found in these uh, video samples, um, you can see that there's definitely a seasonal pattern. Um, winter diversity was much lower than in the summer. And um, we observed over 2,500 um, individuals and saw almost 80 taxa um, during this study. The most numerous um, are not, not a surprise if you're familiar with the area, pinfish were the most numerous. And we actually saw less of them in the summer and more of them over natural hard bottom. And then gray snapper were mo most abundant in the summer and fall, and we saw less of them over natural hard bottom and more of them over artificial and bridge habitats. Next. So this is an MDS of the complete fish assemblage. So we looked at all species on these videos, um, and uh, I'll just orient you to the graph. The symbols are, um, the habitat and then the colors are the season. And the first thing that kind of pops out at you is that all the circles are grouped together and that's the natural hard bottom. So they were very, those communities were very similar to one another. And then the artificial hard bottom was separated from that. And then the bridge um, habitats, which are the crosses, they were kind of scattered throughout and a little more variable. And you see from our Permanova analyses here that habitat was actually the most important factor in um, describing the assemblages, followed by season. So you can see that summer and fall are kind of near the bottom of the graph, and then winter and spring are up near the top. So those were separated out as well. Next. Okay, so on natural hard bottom, we saw, woo. <laughs> um, natural hard bottom, we saw mostly sand perch and pinfish. 
um, on the artificial heart, or on the bridge habitats, we saw spade fish and sheep's head, the ones with the stripes, which makes sense, you know, living on bridge habitats. Um, gray snapper were, or um, white grunt were most uh, abundant over an artificial, and then gray snapper were, like I said before, mo most abundant on artificial um, bridge habitats. Next. We also saw several other reef fish species. So this included lane snapper and black sea bass in addition to the white grunt and gray snapper. Um, and the ones with the stars actually contributed significantly to those community differences. Next. We also saw some rare or new observations. And by new, I mean they're not new species, but they just haven't been recorded in monitoring programs within the bay. So because most of the estuarine sampling is done with nets, some of these species we just hadn't seen. Um, so the top row are fish that um, had been collected in nets, but in very low numbers. And, and we actually saw more of them on this small three-year study. And then the bottom row are ones that, that had not been recorded in net sampling. But the two with the stars, we actually did see on a previous hard bottom study using traps. So we know that those fish are associated with those hard bottom habitats. Next. And we didn't just see fish. So we had some cameos by a cormorant and a green sea turtle. Um, so, so we're getting some really cool information about, you know, what, what types of wildlife and fish are using these areas. Next. So what about estuarine hard bottom? Um, it looks like from this study, we found a gear type that can characterize this area and it fits well in between the other monitoring programs that are happening within the bay. So um, next. So we're able to use these bruvs um, for that. And we also use some hook and line sampling to get, you know, length data. So where does this fit in with the rest of the sampling and how, how are these assemblages different? Next. So this um, kind of fun Venn diagram kind of uh, shows you how estuarine hard bottom fits in with the other habitats. So you can see that there's a lot of overlap in this uh, area with seagrass habitats um, sampled with sands and then offshore reefs that are also um, sampled using cameras. Um, you can see pinfish are found on hard bottom and seagrass in high abundances. You can also see that sand perch and blue runner are found um, on estuarine hard bottom and offshore reefs. Um, the, that one area in the middle actually shows all the fish that are found in all three habitats. And uh, that's really cool because we can actually look at connectivity between inshore and offshore. So the next slide I'll be talking um, using an example. So gray snapper is one that we found in high abundance in all, thank you, in all three habitats. And if you look at, uh, you can see how abundant they are in the seagrass areas in lower Tampa Bay up in the top map. And then you can see they're very abundant in the estuarine hard bottom samples that um, we had, and then there were also some fixed stations that were sampled at the same time offshore. So you can see we've got high abundances there. Um, the cool thing about this, and this, this, it's great that Megan was doing the size class thing because this goes right in line with that. So when we're looking at, you know, inshore habitats, we're obviously seeing smaller fish. So if you look at this uh, length frequency, the seines and trawls are in the green and yellow, and you can see that there's much smaller fish um, captured there. Um, and then when you go into the hook and line uh, data that we did in association with these camera um, deployments, you can see they're a little bit larger. And then um, we also pulled in some fisheries dependent data, um, which are fish that are captured by recreational anglers. And so you can see the inland um, targeted fish are a little bit larger. And then as you go offshore, they get even larger. So we're getting a good cross section of the life history of the fish. Next. And we can do similar things with abundances. Um, and this is not, um, this is just kind of a first stab at it, but we know that the, the size classes change over habitats. And you can see in the net samples, you know, you've got this kind of um, higher abundances in 2014 and 2015 up here at the, I wish I had a pointer, but right here at the top of the, the green. Um, and then if you go into 2017 for estuarine hard bottom, um, you can see somewhat of a peak um, in 2017, a couple of years later as those fish grow. And then when you look at the fixed stations offshore, you can see there's 
a little bit higher abundance, but very variable in 2019 looking at, um, at those data. So we can begin to see how these habitats fit in uh, with the other sampling. Next. So finally, in summary, um, the fish assemblages uh, over estuarine hard bottom, um, there was some seasonality there, differences between summer and winter. Uh, the differences were mostly associated with habitat followed by season and year. And then we saw a lot of pinfish and gray snapper. And because of, um, <laughs> because of the, uh, because of we were looking at all the fish species, we were able to document some unique things. Uh, next. And then finally, what that means for management and monitoring. Um, this methodology was successful and it can be incorporated into normal monitoring to get at this missing link. Um, we also have a clear picture of life history um, for, for fish from inshore to offshore. And because it's a passive gear, we're able to look at all the different species and fish assemblages there. So it's pretty useful. So we recommend conservation, protection, and continued monitoring. Next. I'd like to thank all of our cooperators, our funding source that was TBRF, um, and next, if I have time for questions. I hope I hit all the points. Because <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. I think we have time for one question. Um, so I know you said you use the baited arm um, because sometimes you have issues with turbidity, but did you have any issues with turbidity in terms of like not having conclusive video where you couldn't actually identify the fish coming up to the baited arm? So I'm not sure how we got this lucky, but we were actually able to read all of our videos um, except for one. And that one was deployed on the shady side of the skyway, so it was completely black. Um, so, so we did pretty well. We actually um, resumed sampling in 2021 um, because of the red tide that went through, and there were several times that we had to resample um, because of that. Um, so, so obviously, one of the downsides of this is that you know if you can't see the fish, it's not useful. But for the most part, we were able to at least get some information off of it. And we have a whole range of visibilities and we rate that um, when we're reading the videos ranging from zero to 10, whether it's very clear or unreadable. And we only had that one unreadable video from this time frame. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Our next speaker I'm going to introduce is uh, Tanya Wiley, and she is the president of Havenworth Coastal Conservation, and she's also the team leader for the U.S. Sawfish Recovery Team, and she's going to be talking about the history of sawfish in Tampa Bay. Thanks, Carrie. Good evening. Next. Maybe, hopefully, all right, awesome. <laughs> um, so sawfish are an elasobranch. Um, they are a very large, distinctive type of ray. Uh, easy to see how they get their name. Uh, they have this elongated rostrum sticking off the front of their head that commonly is referred to as the saw. Um, there's five species of sawfish found around the world. And here in the United States, we used to have two species of sawfish that at one time were both considered to be very common and abundant. And unfortunately, I have to say, we used to have two species. Um, the two species that we had here, um, there's a lot of different um, morphological characters that you can use to distinguish them. Fin shape and placement, for example. But the easiest way to tell them apart is by the tooth count on the saw or the rostrum. The small tooth sawfish on the left has 22 to 29 teeth on either side of the rostrum. And they can actually vary by as much as three teeth counts uh, per individual. So one sawfish might have 23 on one side and 25 on the other. Another sawfish has 24 on one side and 27 on the other. Uh, so that's one way we can identify individuals through photographs or aerial surveys or things that we're doing. Uh, the large tooth sawfish on the right, that one has 16 to 20 rostral teeth on either side. 
Um, so when we look historically at where these two species were found on the right, the large two sawfish had a circumtropical um, distribution here in the United States. We had it in the Gulf of Mexico from Texas to Florida, uh, but it was always more common in the Western Gulf of Mexico, west of the Mississippi River. Most of our records of this species are from Texas. Um, the small two sawfish, on the other hand, um, is only found in the, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and here in the United States, we had it from Texas to Florida and up as far as even to North Carolina. Uh, more records of small two sawfish from the eastern Gulf of Mexico, uh, mostly in Florida. Next. So the large two sawfish, uh, we know from um, photographs and records and logbooks um, that this species was very common in the early 1900s. Uh, but already by the mid-1950s, this species was becoming severely depleted. We weren't seeing it show up in, in newspapers and photographs and logbooks anymore. And the last record of this species uh, in Florida was in 1943, 79 years ago. And unfortunately, the last record in all of the United States for this species was in Texas uh, 61 years ago in, in 1961. So we consider this species to be uh, locally extinct here in the United States. So the small two sawfish is doing a little better. Um, it's an endangered species, but at least we do still have that one. Um, so when we started the research in, in the early 2000s, there actually wasn't scientific library of literature for this species. So we just started digging through all these log books, going to the library. This was before the internet. So we were working on microfish, digging up all these old records. Uh, but you can see here, each one of these yellow dots is where we know someone caught or saw a sawfish. So we have records going all the way back to 1782. Um, and you can see they were found from Texas to Florida and up, up the mid-Atlantic. We have one dot, yellow dot there in New York. That was a sawfish that was landed in New York, but we don't know where it was caught. Um, but what I want to point out on this map is the red area down in southwest Florida. That's where over half of those records um, are of sawfish. So of the 3,500 records, half of those were in, in southwest Florida from Charlotte Harbor down through uh, 10,000 Islands and Everglades National Park. And the red arrow is us here in Tampa Bay. Uh, and you can see we are in that dark blue shaded area um, where 90% of those records were. So we were well within the range of the species uh, back historically. Next. Um, we fast forward now, we're only looking at records from 1964 on. So we've already lost the large two sawfish. Um, now we, you can see we've completely lost the small two sawfish north of Florida in the Atlantic. It's kind of barely clinging on over in Texas uh, on the central coast there. Um, that red area uh, where half of those records are has shrunk a little bit. Um, now it doesn't contain Charlotte Harbor anymore. It's 10,000 Islands, um, Everglades National Park. And us here in Tampa Bay, we're kind of um, halfway in that blue area now already. And then next, um, when we look at the very sad picture of sawfish now, um, gone from the Atlantic north of Florida, um, gone from the Gulf west of Florida, and um, we in Tampa Bay are now no longer in that dark blue area where 90% of the records of sawfish are. Um, so we are at the very northern extent of the sawfish range uh, now up here in Tampa Bay. Next. Um, so the causes for the decline, how we've lost one of these species already, and, and the other one is now an endangered species, um, probably not a surprise to anybody, fishing mortality. Um, they were a, a great sport fish. People like to go out and rod and reel fish for them, but also particularly on the other coast in the Indian River Lagoon, um, it was a very popular um, spear fishing or gigging sport fish. Um, and then, of course, because of their toothed rostrum, they're very easily caught in nets. And so when we started mass fishing with shrimp trawls and gill nets, um, the nets are the fishermen's livelihood. They weren't going to cut the net to remove the sawfish. So um, sawfish caught in nets were killed. Usually the rostrum was cut off and kept as a trophy. Um, of course, loss of inshore nursery habitat. We heard about you know places where you find food and don't become food. Um, for sawfish, that's shallow estuarine areas with mangrove lined shorelines. And of course, we've developed a lot of that throughout Florida and the southeastern United States. And they're low reproductive capacity. Um, they have to be about 11 or 12 feet long before they start reproducing. That's seven years old. And the females give birth to about a dozen young probably every other year. So we were taking them out of the population way quicker than they were able to uh, uh, put one back in. Yes. Um, I could spend a whole hour talking about sawfish trade and the weird things that sawfish are used for around the world, but just briefly, some of the major uses for sawfish that continue to be a problem 
for the five species of sawfish around the world. Um, their fins are very highly prized for the shark fin soup market in Asia. The bottom right picture is a picture of a caudal fin, a tail fin of a sawfish that was confiscated in trade there along with a couple of saws. Um, I mentioned, you know, fishermen keep the saws as trophies. That's still a problem that we have today. Uh, but people also buy them as souvenirs. And the middle photograph is a kid uh, selling saws to tourists down in the Keys about 100 years ago. Um, the rostra are sold in pharmacies in Asia, ground up to make the base of medicines. Live sawfish were traded for the aquarium trade. Two that are closest to us are in SeaWorld in Orlando that they got from the Keys in the 1980s. Um, so you can go see them. They're really cool to see. Next. Um, the roster are used in some ceremonial weapons and religious ceremonies. Um, they decorate them, put handles on them. Um, they can get very ornate and fancy. Uh, one of the big problems is the cockfighting industry down in Central and South America. They use the rostral teeth um, to make artificial spurs uh, for the for cockfighting. So we have some NGOs that have been trying to develop uh, an artificial material or 3D print or replica of this, but um, that industry is willing to pay a lot of money um, for these rostral teeth for cockfighting. Um, so in response to that decline of losing a species and the other one uh, drastically declining, it largely went unnoticed. Kind of the only people that noticed it were the net fishermen who were kind of happy about it. Um, but the state of Florida was actually really proactive and in 92 protected both species of sawfish, making them catch and release only. Um, I put the asterisk there for the inshore gill net ban that was voted on in 94, was implemented in 95. It didn't have anything to do with sawfish, but definitely removed one of the major sources of mortality for sawfish here in Florida, that inshore gill net ban. So that's important for us to keep uh, for sawfish. Uh, in 99, NOAA Fisheries received a petition to list both species of sawfish as endangered. That's when I came on. I was working for Texas Parks and Wildlife at the time, moved over here to work at Moat, started that status review, digging up all those records, making the, the maps with all the sightings that we could find. Uh, we published that in 2000, the status review, determining that, yep, in fact, sawfish are endangered. Uh, and the small tooth sawfish was listed as endangered in 2003. It was the first fully marine fish listed on the ESA. Uh, we spent the next several years developing a recovery plan, how we're going to save the sawfish that are left and, and ultimately recover them. That is our goal, is to recover them, get them uh, reestablished in some of the places where they used to be and uh, get them off the ESA. Uh, we also designated critical habitat. Those are the nursery areas for the uh, small sawfish down in Charlotte Harbor and 10,000 Islands. And in 2014, uh, the large tooth sawfish was also added to the ESA. So if there's one swimming around in the Gulf of Mexico out there or one comes up here from Central America, uh, it's protected. So both species now are protected uh, by the state of Florida and uh, federally on the ESA. So now let's focus on Tampa Bay. That's what we're here for. So um, we just got this brand new beautiful pier, but the original pier was actually the um, Orange Belt Railway Terminus that opened in 1889, uh, the photograph on the left there. That quickly became a very popular fishing spot. And there's an example of a sawfish that was caught um, just off, off that pier uh, 10 years after that uh, uh, facility opened. So. Um, another photograph on the right there is a 14-foot, 6-inch sawfish weighing 660 pounds caught in St. Petersburg. Here's a photograph of a couple sawfish that were caught, um, it just says, on one of the beaches near St. Petersburg. Um, love that there's like no development in the background, can't imagine that. Next. Uh, and uh, down where I live in Palmetto and work, here's a 14-foot sawfish that was caught in Palmetto at what was then called the Hendricks Shipping Dock. This is now the Palmetto Boat Ramp and River House Restaurant. I do a lot of work down there on sharks, have yet to catch a sawfish down there, but we know they existed at one time. Next. Uh, and we get reports now. So you can go on YouTube and you can um, search sawfish Anna Maria. You'll see a lot of uh, videos of big sawfish being caught at the piers at Anna Maria. Uh, 2019, three large sawfish were caught in the turtle relocator trawl that was clearing the way for the uh, dredge for the ship channel. And just last February, a seven-foot sawfish was videoed at the Apollo Beach power plant on the big flat um, outside the power plant. Next. Um, so when we look at these records by decade, we have 119 records of sawfish in Tampa Bay. These are verified records that we know were sawfish. Um, next. And not surprisingly, most of these are since 2000. This is when we started the research, started asking people to let us know um, if they catch or see sawfish. 
Next. When we break them down by county, um, we included the state waters offshore, but we did not include Sarasota County because the records from Sarasota County were from the south part of the county in Lemon Bay and Mayaka River, which are actually part of Charlotte Harbor. Um, and so what you can see here is most of them are occurring within Tampa Bay. Uh, we have the two unknown ones. One we just know was in old Tampa Bay, but we're not sure on which side of it, so we don't know what county, and one that just said Tampa Bay. Um, so again, don't know what county. Next, um, and just to put this number into perspective, so we have 119 records since 1892 of sawfish in Tampa Bay. Down in Charlotte Harbor, we get 200 to 300 reports a year of sawfish. So just shows you how we are just way at the northern extent of their range up here. Uh, but the good news is in the last five years, we've had 26 reports, uh, verified reports of sawfish in the Tampa Bay area, good disbursement there around the bay. Uh, all size classes, we're getting neonate sawfish up my Courtney Campbell Bridge, large sawfish around Egmont Skyway. Um, next. Uh, so most of our research, research has been focusing uh, in southwest Florida, where most of the sawfish are, um, but because of these recent reports, next, uh, we decided it was time to start a directed project up here in the Tampa Bay, um, so that's where I came in and we're doing that now, next. Um, so we go out with long lines, gill nets, we're even using underwater and aerial surveys to look for sawfish, next. Of course, take a lot of measurements and samples and tags on them and in them when we catch them next. Um, and we're using uh, internal transmitters now, thankfully, and thanks to ITAG, we have a tremendous array of receivers that are tracking animals uh, in Tampa Bay, um, including some TBIRF funded work, uh, PI by uh, Dr. Jane Gardner at New College. Um, so we have a pretty good infrastructure of receivers and we've been managed to detect six sawfish in this red uh, box in lower Tampa Bay. Of course, that's where a lot of our um, infrastructure is. So we're starting to put receivers um, up in Tampa Bay now, also trying to detect some sawfish in these strategic areas. Next. Uh, so the good news um, is that um, on this map, these two sawfish here were research caught sawfish. Next, so last spring, um, right after the height of Piney Point, uh, we got a call from a guy who was walking the beach in Reddington Beach and he said, I'm looking at this little baby I think it's a sawfish swimming here in the river. Uh, we responded to it, and in fact, we were able to find uh, two newborn sawfish um, at the beach in uh, Reddington Beach, tagged them, took samples, had a nice bottle of wine that night, cracking up, being very happy that we tagged some sawfish in Tampa Bay. <laughs> Next. Um, so our priorities now are, you know, we want to continue our field surveys. We want to tag animals up here. Most importantly, we want to get genetics from the animals up here so we can investigate their relationship to the animals down in Charlotte Harbor and uh, down in the Keys. Back. Uh, we want to find, of course, long-term funding to uh, maintain and expand our array, take over the entire Tampa Bay with receivers to detect animals that are tagged um, down in Charlotte Harbor in the Keys and, and again, investigate that relationship of, of the, the Tampa Bay sawfish uh, with the Charlotte Harbor and, and Keys sawfish. Um, expand our outreach and our education efforts, um, next, which includes hanging these metal signs at marinas and piers and um, laminated versions at bait shops and boat ramps, um, you know, letting people know how to safely and legally interact with sawfish. Um, we also have next rack cards that we're distributing at anywhere that'll let us um, put up a rack card. Thanks. And next. And of course, we ask everybody to let us know if they catch or see a sawfish. Um, this helps us target our field surveys. That's how we manage to catch those uh, at Reddington Beach. Um, it also helps us monitor the population, see where they're being and when they're being in certain places, uh, and also evaluate the effectiveness of our ongoing uh, management and uh, conservation efforts. Next and next. I don't think I have time for questions, but thanks. You can catch me later uh, if you have questions, I think. Thank you so much, Tanya. All right, our next speaker is Roman Jessian uh, with Maryland Coastal Bays Program, and he'll be just be discussing an innovative way to provide fish passage while retaining an old mill pond. Thank you and good morning. Just to get you started on, on my talk today, so uh, what did the 
fish swimming his first marathon say when he reached the wall? Damn. <laughs> so um, essentially, um, that's where I'm going to go today. But um, the uh, idea here is, uh, um, go ahead, is uh, um, uh, I think most of us are, are looking at a, a, a way to um, uh, promote connectivity. Here we're looking at um, uh, those of us that are on the um, work in the lagoons along the uh, along the the uh, uh, Atlantic and, and Gulf, more Atlantic than Gulf, I guess. Um, we're looking for uh, from watershed out to the ocean connectivity, and once that connectivity is broken, um, we have uh, lowered resilience. Go ahead. So this talk is probably the Florida is probably the worst place to give this talk that I that I uh, can think of. Um, if we looked at <clears throat> fragmentation that that uh, from this. Uh, uh, this map, if you look at Florida, Florida has the least number of dams um, of anybody in the United States. Here we've got all along the East Coast is a really common um, issue with these uh, the fragmentation in, uh, in streams, um, uh, uh, fragmentation from the ocean to the um, to headwaters. Um, Florida doesn't seem to have that problem. But the 24 then, of the dams that you do have then become really important in terms of uh, connectivity. Go ahead. So these uh, dams are typically um, small head, uh, although we do have uh, a number of uh, uh, larger dams, but uh, this is from a, a Facebook uh, post. It's nice to see that they're um, popularizing the uh, fact that they're reducing the number of dams um, and uh, promoting free flowing rivers. Um, however, you can't have a free flowing river everywhere. So there's uh, historical um, uh, aspects. There's uh, uh, people are used to uh, dams and mill ponds. Um, grandma used to skate in the mill pond. We can't get rid of it. Um, used for um, irrigation. Um, and as you can see here, there's uh, fantastic freshwater fishing in, in a lot of these um, mill ponds. So we can have a choice there. Do we provide some kind of connectivity in terms of a uh, uh, smaller number of species for, for passage or do we um, promote uh, free flowing rivers? Um, uh, and what I'd like to present, go ahead, is a, uh, a, a different option uh, for uh, stream management when free flowing is not an option. Um, uh, what I want to talk about is this innovative use of a regenerative stream channel, and I'll talk about that in uh, a little bit. Go ahead. So this is a, a, a modification of a number of uh, techniques, um, uh, certainly the uh, traditional step pool design, and uh, it's a similar to uh, a beaver dam analog, but it's a little bit more than that. This uh, regenerative stream channel is uh, really engineered um, and it's not just dumping a pile of rocks and stopping the water and um, letting it slow down. So it's a, a really system of riffles and pools to intercept the uh, water. Um, the uh, um, won't go into the, the details on here, but um, is that it's uh, engineered structure that it's um, uh, more than um, dumping rocks on a, uh, on a on a stream channel. Go ahead. So uh, to further this concept, it's uh, uh, the um, the weirs or dams are, are parabolic shaped system of of riffles designed to spread the water surface and decrease erosive factors. Um, important here is a native community, native plant community that knits the site together. This is uh, of utmost importance in this whole regenerative uh, um, channel. Um, it produces habitat and contributes carbon to the system, which is 
um, vital in terms of nutrient reduction. So we've used technique in uh, two areas in the coastal bays. Um, the one is uh, um, up at the top of our watershed and the other one is at the bottom. Uh, Bishopville is the one that was recently completed and uh, Big Mill Pond, go ahead, is uh, the one that uh, we're currently trying to permit. So Bishopville is, uh, the dam is 93 feet across and Big Mill is uh, smaller, it's 18 feet. Uh, dam height is uh, roughly the same, four feet and three feet. Um, we've got about a, over five miles of stream that we're uh, looking to uh, uh, provide uh, a, a freshwater habitat for anadromous fish. Um, dams are old. Uh, uh, they predate the earliest maps that I could find. Um, so these are around colonial times. Uh, a lot of them in the late 1600s, there was at least something there. Current dams are uh, 90 and 60 years. So go ahead. This is a, a schematic of the one at Bishopville. As you can see, there's uh, the um, yellow is sand and the arrows are uh, the weirs. Uh, go ahead. Um, the dam elevation was brought up to the top of the berm. So we have a series of uh, essentially uh, step pools. Um, go ahead. One more. So the riffles are one foot in elevation. Each riffle is one foot in elevation higher and they're 20 foot uh, in width. Go ahead. And uh, this particular system has a spillway in case of um, uh, really high water. Um, it's designed at the 100 year flood to be totally uh, submersed. Um, as the, the idea is to, as the water rises, it spreads out and the erosive forces are decreased. So um, once this thing goes underwater, then there are no real erosive forces to, um, to really de uh, destabilize any of, the, uh, any of the structures. Oh, the spillway. So the fish passage is for um, American eels, uh, not so much the they can crawl up about just about anything on a, on a uh, uh, rainy um, spring afternoon, um, but no other anadromous fish occur above uh, these dams or uh, both of the dams. Our target species are alewife, blueback herring, white perch, um, gizzard shad, not so much uh, considered garbage fish, but certainly an important part of the uh, the ecosystem and uh, hickory shed. Uh, residents are important too. The dams are at the head of tide typically, um, and uh, we'll see uh, salinities up to 20, 15 to 25 parts per thousand fresh water um, above the dam. So uh, there's little chance of survival as these fish, the resident fish go over and there's no way for them to, to get back. So this is uh, um, our other one, uh, uh, other project, uh, Big Mill Pond. With this, this is um, showing the um, elasticity of this this approach. So most of these steps are put are below the dam in this particular instance, um, and that's because the pond owners didn't want to see um, trees in their pond. They wanted to see open water. So. We just moved the uh, the step pools down so the fish were going up and then over the dam. Of, uh, that last weir that you see above the road is the, now will become the dam, but it's termed uh, a berm, which is a little bit um, interesting in that um, it will now be taken off the dam register for dam safety and it will be considered a natural obstruction. So uh, this is uh, going to be a win for us that uh, uh, when they're considering it to be uh, more of a, a natural barrier than uh, a dam. Problem here is that uh, go back. The problem here is that um, <laughs> below the road is a, a, a bald cypress uh, forest. So there's uh, some challenges and put with the uh, the construction in the uh, cypress forest, so uh, 
we're working on uh, uh, trying to get that permitted. Go ahead. So this is a sequence just of uh, construction. So first there's a, uh, the berm is uh, uh, constructed out into the pond and then the um, subsequent um, berms parallel or perpendicular to the initial berm. Um, then there's a, a tidal berm that's created. And then at the end, go ahead, is the dam is taken out. Too many. All right, so go ahead. So this is what it looks like. The, uh, you can see the outline of the pond. Um, uh, that circle uh, kind of gets obliterated here with the, with the riffles in. So we have four non-tidal riffles, and then we get down to uh, two more tidal riffles. Uh, those tidal riffles needed to be put in because the tide um, is uh, um, the tidal fluctuation is great great enough that at low tide then fish aren't able to to pass. So we put that last one in for uh, really for the for the low tides. Go ahead. So the completed project is uh, uh, was completed in 2014. Uh, we put a fifth weir in um, uh, two years later because uh, uh, fish had problems navigating up at, at really low tides. Um, we've got approximately 600 feet of stream that we didn't have before. Our additional non, uh, half acre of non-tidal wetlands. So we reduced our four acre pond to 3.2 acres. We planted a thousand Atlantic white cedar and 200 bald cypress along with a whole lot of, lot of other um, uh, herbs and forbs and so forth. Uh, uh, the pond used to be ringed in about 30 feet of uh, solid Phragmites, um, and we were able to remove the Phragmites and raise the water level enough that the uh, um, Phragmites is uh, more of a minor nuisance than, than what we saw before. Go ahead. But does it work? Go ahead. Yes, it does. Um, so this is our monitoring summary from uh, 2015 to 2019. Um, the uh, uh, fish trap or the, the uh, thike net was put at the top of the, the project. And as you could see, our total number of fish um, increased over those years. Um, we had some issues uh, early on um, in uh, getting set up, but uh, subsequent to that, we had a pretty consistent um, uh, uh, fish, fish catch. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, most of our species were our target species, alewife, gizzard shad, and white perch, um, and then a list of uh, resident species uh, that were um, using that uh, fish passage uh, uh, as uh, um, uh, moving upstream and downstream, so they were able to utilize that entire uh, stream length. One thing that we uh, um, didn't anticipate is the uh, use of turtles of that uh, facility. Um, we used to have uh, uh, the, the road um, bisecting that uh, um, uh, the dam area was uh, used to be littered with uh, uh, turtle shells from uh, turtles that tried to cross the road um, that got smashed. Um, and uh, we provided a good passage for those turtles that uh, didn't need to get up to the road to, to get to the, <laughs> to get to the other side. So um, that was an unexpected benefit that we saw. Um, our target species, uh, were, we saw increasing numbers um, with, uh, as the years went by. Uh, um, go ahead. So in conclusion then, it seems that the restoration is uh, successful. You know, we'll be looking for uh, additional uh, anadromous species going up. Um, hopefully um, hickory shad uh, will be will be seeing it's a little bit too large for American shed. The um, uh, river is a little bit too small for American shed. Um, but uh, we do uh, hope we'll see uh, hickory shed. Uh, Big Mill Pond, uh, we're working on permitting. The uh, bald cypress grove is, uh, uh, is a challenge and uh, we're looking for other 
opportunities in the uh, uh, in the watershed, and that's uh, uh, so. The last slide is uh, shows the uh, what it looks like um, currently um, as the vegetation uh, really has taken over and uh, really knitted that whole um, whole project together. And that's it. Questions? <clears throat> so okay. coming from oh sorry. I'm sorry, we don't have time for questions. So if you can catch up with <laughs> with Roman afterwards. Oh well. We don't have time for questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, our last presenter is online, and um, she uh, is, and her name is uh, Carolyn Jarity, and um, she is the restoration projects manager for Morro Bay National Estuary Program, and she's going to be talking about. I'll go ahead and let her her explain. Hi, good morning. Yeah, my name is Carolyn Garrity. I'm going to be telling you about um, pike minnow and steelhead in the Morro Bay watershed. We've had some competing conservation priorities in our watershed I wanted to discuss with you today. Um, I'll try to go fast so you guys can continue to ask questions um, for some of the other presenters as well. Um, next slide. <clears throat> And Morro Bay Estuary is on the central coast of um, California, and that's where I'm logging in today. Carolyn, we can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, can you try talking now? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, okay, can you hear the, is the volume okay? Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Carolyn Garrity. I'm with the Morro Bay National Estuary Program on the central coast of California. And I'm gonna talk to you today about um, pike minnow and steelhead in our watershed. And there's been some competing conservation priorities uh, between these two fish species in our watershed. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so there's an invasive uh, Sacramento pike minnow and it's native to areas of California, but it um, is invasive to our um, local watershed. And it's a predatory fish at its adult stage and it um, directly feeds on larval uh, central coast steelhead and also competes for um, for food and resources in the watershed. And then we also have the federally listed uh, Central Coast Steelhead that we've been working to um, restore its population in the watershed. Next slide, please. So the invasive pike minnow was introduced um, to a reservoir at a prison called the California Men's Colony in the 70s. Next slide. And um, it has now been able to populate most of the main stem of our watershed. So here you see the reservoir to the right of the screen. Um, and the red line depicts where the pike minnow have introduced most of the main stem, and this is one of the more bay estuary here. So we have a fairly small watershed, um, and we also um, have a number of fish passage barriers. There's a main highway that parallels um, Choro Creek, and um, so pike minnow have been able to mostly populate the main stem and then up to these fish passage barriers. And um, let's see, and then you can see that pike uh, steelhead um, do have access um, to a, um, a wider range of area. Uh, but are still competing with pike minnow. Next slide. 
so the removal of these uh, fish barriers that I just showed you um, have been previously um, postponed because they wanted to, we wanted to limit um, the distribution of pike minnow um, upstream. And so that's where we were for a number of years. Um, and we wanted to um, allow access um, for steelhead um, to all these other tributaries, um, especially with the climate change with um, you know, increasing temperatures and things like that. A lot of the tributaries have cooler water. Um, but there's a conflict within agencies on the best next steps on um, whether we should um, continue managing for pike minnow or move forward with fish passage um, barriers. Next slide. Um, so the estuary program um, ended up prioritizing habitat improvements for steelhead over concerns about pike minnow range. Um, and we um, completed this through um, a range of collaborative science, innovative assessments, and targeted education with agencies um, of our unique uh, local conditions. So we are very, we have a very small watershed and it's about 14 miles and um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife who, um, you know, would permit this work um, had some concerns about the effectiveness of um, invasive fish management. Um, and so on one hand, uh, they wanted, didn't want us to remove the fish barriers, but they also um, were helping us uh, manage pike minnow there. So we were sort of, um, um, uncertain on where to move forward. So we worked with Stillwater Sciences, a local um, consulting group to create a pike minnow management plan. And this had targets for five years of management. Next slide. <clears throat> so we had um, targets in the reservoir, which is the source population um, of less than three adults in the reservoir. And then we also wanted um, less than 20 adults um, during snorkel surveys of the main stem creek, Choro Creek and its tributaries. And then the ratio of steelhead to pike minnow um I mean greater greater than one to one with multi-pass electrofishing. Next slide. So we um used internal funding to um complete pipe minnow management for a few years, but we we're still having issues um, with getting grant funding um for this project um through CFNW and um them kind of coming on board. Um so we did um kind of an innovative innovative study with eDNA. So environmental DNA, and we looked, it was a diet analysis. So a lot of times we're using eDNA in the water to look for the presence of um, different fish species. Um, so this is one of the first times that um, we actually use it for the gut contents of fish to look at how much predation um, pike minnow um, were um, predating on steelhead. Um, so this uh, <clears throat> diet analysis, oh, can you go back? Thank you. Um, so within the study, we found that um, nearly 20% of pike minnow had DNA detected. And then um, to scale that up, that estimated about 7,000 juvenile steelhead um, were eaten per year by pike minnow. So this helped us to bolster you know, our data and knowledge about the impacts of pike minnow on steelhead in the watershed. And so if we continue to manage steelhead, our hope is you know, to um, increase the juvenile survival um, and ultimately the adult population. And this particular study um, references listed there. Next slide. So in the reservoir, we use gill nets um, for three to four days um, to ch target the source population. Um, within the creek system, we did multi-pass backtrack electrofishing. Um, and these are areas we went to the same locations um, year after year to look at um, population abundance and size distribution. Um, and then we use single pass electrofishing on other areas of the creek to maximize um, time and basically just remove fish, but not necessarily count and measure each one. And then some of the pools um, were too deep for e fishing, so we just uh, used angling. Next slide. <clears throat> so these are just some photos of us managing. So you can just do these slides for a second. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. We also um, found some other um, invasive and native fish species. Next slide. Um, so that's also been um, kind of a byproduct of this um, sampling. Next slide. This is just a map kind of showing how we've broken down particular reaches and um, sampled a large part of the, the main stem. Next slide. And so onto a few results. Um, this shows the total fish caught. Um, throughout the last five years of management. And I've just highlighted steelhead and pike minnow and the numbers have fluctuated between the years. Um, for example, we had the lowest numbers of steelhead when we first started out, um, the highest numbers of pike minnow. And um, we have seen mostly increasing um, numbers of steelhead and pike minnow has fluctuated over time. 
um, and then next slide. And then the ratio of pipe minnows steel hog was one of our um, targets. Oh, can you go back for a second? And um, we did see that the first year um, we had more pipe minnow than steelhead, and then that has um, increased and stayed fairly stable throughout the four years. Um, so we're excited to see that. Next slide. Um, and uh, you can do one more slide. <clears throat> and so, um, we also this is looking at habitat units so this is areas where we've done multi uh, multi-pass electrofishing um the same location each year and so these are different areas where we've sampled and then this shows um this shows abundance here so you can see that in some areas it thinks like my line shifted a little bit here but some areas we have seen where steelhead you know um had lower numbers initially and then we're able to um, increase over time where we've seen sort of the reverse trend in pike minnow and obviously like more years of data will help us to um, see larger trends but um, so far we're some, seeing some success with our management next slide and so this has also allowed us to uh, move between the eDNA study and then also showing some um, good results in our management have allowed us to move forward with um, two fish passage barriers on one of the main tributaries San Luis Cedo Creek next slide so so far we've seen some signs of success um, in the reservoir um, we only find one pike minnow in 2017 and this year we um, did finally get state funding for three years of management and um, we're going to check again to see if that's still true and then pike minnow density fluctuated between the years but was highest during the first year sampling and lowest in 2020 and the ratio of steelhead to park pike minnow has also been meeting our targets most years um, when looking at uh, density measurements and also total fish captured next slide so um, just kind of our overall outcomes we did have a change in understanding of the impact of pike minnow watershed doing that eDNA study really did help to move um, the permitters and funders along and um, that allowed us to get state funding um, it was actually during year five of our project so the first year we actually had um, adequate funding for the project and then um, it's now opened up um, for some new fish patches projects so that's all i have for you two this morning um, Appreciate you listening. I can take questions. Or if there's not time, that's okay too. We do have time for questions. So this is pretty, this is rather interesting. Um, it kind of, because at first I was kind of leaning towards the idea that improving the habitat made it easier for both species to, you know, populate and have healthy populations, but it seems like the pike minnow has declined. Do you, do you, can you make any conclusions? Do you think it was just that the habitat for the steelhead was less conducive to the pike minnow or what do you think drove the reduction that you're seeing in the pike minnow, if that's correct? I apologize if I'm... Yeah, so we, re we removed about 900 adult pike minnow fish and also some larval fish as well. So um, I think the reduction, I mean, sometimes you do see that they're just changing the location. You know, they might move throughout like a big storm event, for example, might move them to different locations each year. Um, for example, the pike minnow that are resident, but... Um, I think we're hoping that the management did um, make a difference. And then with the fish pastures projects, I think we do see that uh, the pike minnow like warmer water temperatures. So we're hoping that they, you know, would stay more in the main stem um, that has water, warmer water temperatures than the tributaries, where at least steelhead, um, you know, certain times of the year would be able to have access to the tributaries. So we are, um, I guess, you know, still managing for pike minnow and, and plan to do that. For some time but um but that's not holding up anymore us moving forward with fish patches projects and we're also doing a lot of temperature monitoring to because we do see that um they do have sort of different habitats um, that they prefer based on temperature all right um i think we'll end it there because we're gonna have a short break before the next session um two minutes <laughs> bathroom break Coffee, water, go.